Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out to our panel. We're uh, retro blasting. And um, <laughs> thanks. Can you hear me? OK. Um, so who is Retro Blasting? We are a web channel that's based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we collect all kinds of toys. We restore toys. We review cartoons and movies and all sorts of stuff from the 80s. So we're all about uh, vintage, retro 80s fun stuff. We also love going to conventions, and we do some cosplay. So um, we kind of just run the gamut. Yeah, we make videos that are funny. Uh, we try and look at uh, retro in a sort of amusing way. Uh, we, uh, the way that you, as an adult and a Gen Xer especially, have fun with your childhood is to look back on it, you know, look at the things that are good, look at the things that aren't so good or goofy, call a spade a spade. So, so we like to make videos such as Thundercats are racist porno kitties, Transformers ratchet chaps my iron hide. Uh, that's just kind of the, the humor with which we come at some of this. It's never, it's never meant to be inflammatory. We, we, we love all fandom, and, uh, and uh, we, we want to be friends with everyone. So we just want everybody to laugh and have fun with our stuff. Yeah, we're collectors. We collect a wide variety of things. Michael has um, pretty much all of his collection from when he was a kid. Um, and I just recently found my My Little Pony, so I've gotten really into My Little Pony collecting. So between girl and boy toys, we have you know just tons of variety of types of things that we collect. So. Um, yeah, we restore toys as well. So it's not just that we look for the vintage minty originals. We actually go back and we'll, we'll figure out ways to uh, hybrid vehicles and play sets back together to make one because we really feel like saving these toys for future generations. Um, you know, the, the picture on the lower right, that's my buddy Joe. He's a huge Transformers nut. And he and I are dissecting a uh, Kenner Michael Knight Knight Rider car in that. And what we discovered was the voice box, you know, Good evening, Michael. You know that voice box. Um, it's actually a physical record player inside the the unit because it's from the early '80s. Um, it's cool stuff when you discover, uh, you know, when you, when you open up some of these things to fix them. Yeah. So we love '80s play sets. Uh, the 1980s was the pinnacle of action figure play sets. Uh, it started really, uh, and we'll get into this in a little detail, but it started with the Death Star, and we'll talk about why the Death Star really is the benchmark for the leap into the 80s. But um, the, the interesting part about the 1980s from a playset's perspective is that it did not limit itself to a specific scale. Uh, it didn't matter what scale of action figure your line had, they put a playset out with it. They put multiple playsets out with it. It was. It was unreal when you look back on it to, to look at those toy store aisles and see just the sheer variety that they had. Now, some of them weren't good quality, some of them were awesome quality. Some of them were awesome then, and some of them are more awesome now. Kind of like you know a movie that wasn't successful back then, but now it's a cult hit. Uh, there are just a ton of, of play sets from back then, and we're going to review a lot of the highlights uh, from, from the decade. Uh, we're going to kind of go in a chronological order, but we promise we're going to do everything we can not to bore you. Uh, but w what we really wanted to do was kind of capture the, the scope of that decade. Because I think a lot of people, when you, when you go to a toy store or a toy aisle today, you might as well see tumbleweeds going by. You don't see this stuff anymore. It doesn't exist. You see like two pegs full of Star Wars and two pegs full of G.I. Joe and like three pegs of Transformers, but no play sets, barely any vehicles. I mean, it, it really was like a different time. Uh, and I think a lot of us do or do not realize that we lived through it. So pat yourself on the back because you had the best of the best. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the question is, what makes a playset great? And there are a lot of different, everyone has their own idea of what's going to make a playset or any collectible awesome. Um, some people really love the really big, large playsets. Um, I personally really love to see lots of features. So, you know, things that interact with the vehicles and the, the action figures are to scale and that sort of thing. Um, as a collector now, durability is really important. So when we get to things like the Black Star Ice Castle, that thing is so fragile that it's, you know, in shipping, if you were to order one, you know, it, it a lot of times will shatter in shipping because the plastic is just so fragile and older. Um, there's just, overall, there's the nostalgia value. I mean, like, oh, I had that playset when I was a kid and I enjoyed playing with it. So you have those memories. So 
you know, to you, that's your favorite playset. So, um, and then you've got just the general design. Like, can you actually get your hands in there? And like, as a kid, were you able to get your hands in there and play with the toys in there? Did it have a lot of cool rooms and, and different scenes that you could do with your action figures and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So a little brief history before we get into the 1980s. We wanted to kind of back into it a little bit and talk about what came before. Uh, in the 70s, one of the major players was Mego, and then there was um, uh, Marx. Uh, and yeah, even before the 70s. Yes. Was the first people who made play sets were, were Marx, and they made a lot of these sort of, um, sort of generic play sets that weren't um, tied to a certain property like Batman or anything like that. It was more just like, hey, here's a jungle playset or here's a space station playset. And so they had these small little action figures that you could get. And then when you start moving into the 70s, you get things like um, Mego and things like that. And, and Ideal, who I think actually came before Mego and really sort of started uh, using those licensed properties to start selling their play sets and their, their lines. So that was kind of how we got from the beginning to, to that. And the one thing to point out about the Mego play sets, like if you look at the Wizard of Oz or you look at the Star Trek Enterprise, um, those were really just cardboard printout walls and, I, and they were wrapped in what I call uh, binder paper sleeves. Like it was the same plastic that you'd use for a binder sleeve, but it was wrapped around all this cardboard. The Bat Cave was like that, the Enterprise was like that, and then the Bat Cave, I believe, was recycled for Planet of the Apes. Um, they, <laughs> they weren't really, um, they, they, aesthetically at the time, they were unlike anything anyone had ever seen, and so they have like a cool factor. But when you, when you move into the late 70s and we hit a special film that we all know about, everything changes. So let's go back to the 80s. Kenner Star Wars 1978-79, this is when the uh, action figure playset really turned a corner. Now you'll notice that with uh, three of these playsets, the Sandcrawler on the lower right, or the Land of the Jawas on the lower right, the, can the Creature Cantina on the lower left, and the Cantina Adventure set, these um, were either hybrid uh, playsets where they had part plastic, part cardboard, or in the case of the Cantina Adventure playset, it was all cardboard. It was just insert tab A into slot B and hope your dog doesn't step on it. Like it, yep. it was that kind of playset. However, uh, in the middle is the playset that changed, in, in our humble opinion, changed everything. And that was the Death Star Space Station. It was all plastic. Uh, it was, for the most part, durable. It could be a little rickety, but it was, there was nothing that could get soaked and then, you know, crumble into nothing. It had some it had some cardboard wall panels to detail the set on the outside, but the, but the majority of the playset was plastic and it mimicked the movie in many ways. It had you know, the trash compactor, the, the, um, the control room where they uh, you know, jump into the trash compactor. It had the swing area with the extending bridge. It had the cannon. It had the um, uh, tractor beam ledge. It was amazing. It was an amazing playset. And that was the jumping off point where everyone else said, OK, now we have to match that. What are we going to do? Now here, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, the, you know, when Star Wars started doing that, a lot of other companies were like, hey, we got to get in here and, and have some competition. So, you know, Mego started really fleshing out its line. And, um, yeah, it, uh, the, the Mego play sets that tried to compete with it through the licenses of Star Trek The Motion Picture, which, as we all know, is also Star Trek The Motionless Picture, <laughs> uh, and uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, uh, if you look at these play sets, it's hard to tell from the photographs because they're, they're well photographed and they look pretty neat. The play set on the top, which is the bridge of the Enterprise, is actually made from the same kind of um, blow, blow mold plastic that you would get really cheap um, holiday decorations from at Target that you would hang on your, your door where you can grab the plastic and just rip it in half. Like it's really, really bad. Um, and then they just put stickers on it, many of them yellow, and then they, they don't survive. Uh, and then the one on the bottom I love from Mego has the same plastic construction. It's the Starfighter Command Center from Buck Rogers with Gil Gerard. The funny part about this playset is that, do you see the uh, runway right there that the Starfighter's sitting on? That's actually part of the box it came in. <laughs> they, t they told you as part of the playset, yeah, so once you pull it out of the box and put the stickers on it, cut the box off, uh, a big chunk of it, and that's your runway. Awesome! Like it, it's like oh, so I have to destroy the packaging cardboard to get the playset to be complete. It's it's really wonky. Well, as as a general rule, a lot of times 
back then, they were not thinking about longevity in terms of toys. You know, they weren't thinking of collectors in the, the aughts and, you know, 2010, 2017. They were thinking of little kids playing with this and how can we effectively, cheaply get this stuff to market, which is really apparent <laughs> in some of these toys. So here's a question for all of you. This is the Millennium Falcon. Is this a playset or is it a vehicle? Get it? I want to okay. show a hands as to who thinks it's a playset. I think we're half and half. Okay, who thinks it's a vehicle? 50-50. Yep. 50-50, okay. and I think something like the Millennium Falcon really does ride that line of being both. Um, I think everybody's right because, you know, you can, it was so big that it would have been a little difficult, although I'm sure, like, like you, I, I had no problem picking that thing picking up. Picking it up around. and flying it around, but, you know, it, it's also, it's kind of unwieldy if you've got a really small child, so, you know, they could get in there and play with it as a playset. so, you know, you could kind of use it both ways. Now, we get into the Empire Strikes Back. These are the major play sets from the Empire Strikes Back. It's one of the great mysteries of, of the, the Star Wars collecting era. Uh, why the Empire Strikes Back did not have a featured central playset uh, of any importance. It had a, a lot of small vignette playsets, as you can see, uh, and I think it's because they put all of their design effort into the Adat Walker, which you could argue is a playset or a vehicle, much like the uh, Millennium Falcon. But what's interesting here to note is that uh, a lot of these playsets are mostly plastic the Dagobah, the Turret and Probot, and the Imperial Attack Base, which my argument should have been the <coughs> Rebel Attack Base, because I don't remember the Imperials having a trench in the Battle of Hoth. I think that was the <laughs> Rebels. Um, but uh, they also went back to the well a little bit with cardboard. They hadn't completely gotten away from cardboard yet in 1980. Uh, the uh, Rebel Command Center playset in the middle lower, and then the top uh, left land, uh, land of Hoth, or whatever it was called, uh, they were cardboard. Now, the, the notorious one for me is the Cloud City playset, which was a department store exclusive. Uh, it's all cardboard. Um, it has stormtroopers printed on the actual background. So you're always going to have people occupying your playtime, even if you don't want them there. <laughs> uh, and then the other funny thing about it is you would think that Cloud City would have been perfect for a massive playset with the, you know, the, the freeze chamber and the gantry and the control room and all those awesome things. Nope, they, they didn't make one. And they still haven't, to this day, made a full Cloud City playset. I don't know why. So in 80 to 82, playsets get big. And I don't just mean in size, I mean in number. Uh, this is when uh, the uh, industry started to realize that they had to compete with Star Wars, they had to get into that market. The first thing uh, that they did was they, they started trying their best to make some of these playsets. Some of them were good and some of them uh, could have done better. Uh, the one on the top left is the uh, department store exclusive Cobra Command Center, uh, Missile Command Center. That is the most valuable G.I. Joe playset of all time because it was cardboard and as you can imagine, the dog got it and it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are quite rare, even though they were all plastic. The one on the far right is Kristar. Does anyone remember Kristar, or do you remember the robot chicken where the meth heads shatter Kristar and smoke him? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, the, the Kristar playset, the castle, is quite rare, uh, and uh, it, it goes for high dollars now. But it was, as you can see, they started to add features and scale and scope. Now. We all know the one on the top, the bottom left. We all know Castle Grayskull. If you don't know Castle Grayskull, no judgment. I don't know why you're here, though. <laughs> um, Castle Grayskull uh, was the first playset that really upped the ante and said, you know what? We'll make a playset for a figure that's much larger than three and three quarter inches. We'll make a playset for any scale action figure. Watch us do it. Now, the cool part about Castle Grayskull is it has great play features. It's got an elevator, it's got the drawbridge, it's got the trap door, it's got, you know, all this cool stuff. But I start to notice something with these. Hey, Storm Shadow and Destro, sweet. <laughs> um, thanks for coming to our panel. Um, the, uh, the Castle Grayskull started to prove a point that you'll see as a trend throughout the 80s, which was the bigger the playset is, the less detail is actually inside. And I haven't really figured out if that's because that was how they kept the price of the playset down, because they had to make the scale bigger, or if it was simply because the smaller playsets needed to justify their cost to market, so they put more detail in the smaller ones. Um, but that's they, true of vehicles as well. Yes, it is true of vehicles. And so what you'll find in Castle Grayskull is they supplemented the lack of detail with cardboard pieces. 
that you would shove in places. And we can all gather what happened to those cardboard pieces. So if you have a castle grayskull that has all of the cardboard inserts inside, you've got a more valuable castle than anybody else. Now we get to Return of the Jedi. And um, <laughs> hmm. uh, up until this point, uh, Star Wars had had some really amazing playsets, even when they were smaller, such as in Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, as a, someone who personally owns the Ewok Village and has owned it since 1983, Christmas. Uh, I think the Ewok Village looks like three trees after a hurricane. <laughs> I don't think it really looks like much. It has a lot of play features, though. It has an elevator, the net, the boulder. Um, it's got a drum for Ewoks to sing, which I don't didn't really do me much good. Uh, it, it, it was the only main play set in the line. Uh, there was a Jabba the Hutt play set, which to me is more like a big figure. Uh, the problem with the Jabba the Hutt playset that I have is simply that it's not big enough to really be called a playset. It's just Jabba the Hutt on his throne. And uh, the fact that you can open up his throne and throw people inside this little sandbox in inside doesn't really do much for me because I never remember Jabba actually getting up off his chair. <laughs> and so, and the, the gate opening up? Yeah, it's, it's really strange. And then, of course, there was this... Uh, Job of the Hut dungeon, which was not only recycled twice in the in the Return of the Jedi line, but it's actually the Droid Factory from the New Hope line. So it was just a, a department store exclusive both times to sell new action figures. There's really not a lot there. But it but, was cool to see it in that J.C. Penney and Sears catalog. At yes, Christmas time, if you right? saw it in the Wish Book when you were a kid, you were <laughs> like, "Oh, I want 8D8." 1983. Uh, this is where things really start to diversify. Uh, on the left, you have the super rare A-Team Command Center, because as I recall, they were a nomadic group of people that drove around in a big van. <laughs> uh, but they made a command center for them anyway. And, and by the way, just as an aside, if you ever go uh, collect the Galoob six-inch A-Team action figures for which these are, this is what this playset's for, write me and, and tell me if you agree with me that the A-Team action figures had the worst front butt in the history of action figure sculpting. They're wearing mom jeans and they just look ridiculous. Um, and that female is one of the ugliest. Yes, Amy Allen is just, the ugliest female action figure. The actual figure of actress all time. is not, but wow, that is an ugly action figure. Uh, in, the, in the top center, you have LJN's uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Fortress of Fangs playset, which is getting quite rare these days. Uh, it could double perfectly as the Temple of Doom, if you so chose to, to have it like that. Uh, on the far right is the Black Star Ice Castle. Now, Melinda mentioned this earlier. The Black Star Ice Castle. Black Star, of course, was the comp competition to He-Man because they re-aired they re the show so that they could compete with He-Man and they brought out a toy line to compete. Well, the problem is, is that Galoob, the same people that made the front butt A-Team figures, they weren't very skilled at delivering uh, awesome play sets at that point. So they blow molded the Ice Castle out of uh, plastic that was just a little thicker than that Mego Enterprise play set. Now, it was rigid, but that also means it was brittle and it would shatter. Mm -hmm. So if you... Especially 30 years later. Right. So if you, like, tell a really bad pun around it or, you know, it just, <laughs> it just shatters. It's horrible. Um, those, looks cool. Those demon heads glow in the dark, which is actually a really cool feature. The little green things, those are demon heads and they glow, um, which for me, along with the size and, and the design of it, I had to have it. But um, it's on the inside, there's really not much going on in there. It's, it's just like, what are you going to do? It's, it's right there with Snake Mountain in terms of you open it up and it's okay. I guess we can stand in here. That's about it. Yeah. It's like a windbreak. Yeah. There's nothing really else going on. But, but the, the one real, the, the two in the center, the Fortress of Fangs is a very cool play set, all plastic, and the G.I. Joe headquarters, all plastic. Um, and they both had action features that were um, integral to the actual theme of the action figure lines that they were representing. So like the G.I. Joe headquarters had a motor pool that had the lift up uh, platform for the, uh, for the Jeep and it had the, the tank area where the tank could put the cannon through the, the defensive wall. It had a jail for, you know, Cobra Commander and Destro and Storm Shadow. <laughs> hey guys. Um, it was easy to break out of. They did it all the time. Uh, and it, uh, it had a, a main cannon. It was a really cool play set. Um, one of the holdouts that we didn't put on this, uh, on this slide that I wanted to mention though is there was a very short-lived attempt to do a Raiders of the Lost Ark toy line for Indiana Jones. 
and they had a Well of Souls playset. Um, the line didn't do very well, I think in part due to the fact that the, the, the toy line was so laser focused on very specific moments from a film. And so it was super accurate. It had a you know, vac metalized gold arc that I think would actually melt Nazis if you like held it in front of somebody. <laughs> but it just wasn't um, open. It wasn't an open it wasn't enough versatile. world. Yeah. Yes, you couldn't really diversify with it and say, I'm going to do anything but go into the Well of Souls with this. I mean, maybe I wasn't very imaginative, but I'm just speculating that that's why that, that toy line kind of fizzled. We can't not talk about Masters of the Universe on its own slide. Do you want to start with this? Um, well, we already sort of touched on Castle Grayskull, which, you know, by any account is a great playset. I mean, it's, it's fun to, to look at now. It was really super fun back then. Even as a girl, I loved playing with that playset as a kid. Um, some, as, it seems like as Masters of the Universe went along in making their toys and their playsets in particular, they kind of seem to lose focus a little bit. Like, I mean, Eternia, for example, is a great place. It's huge. It's weird. Um, what, it, it just seems like, as a kid, if I had seen that, which I never saw it as a kid, but what would you even do with that? I yeah, mean, the, the, the lower right is Eternia. It's the Holy Grail playset of the Masters of the Universe line. It was, it was made right at the end. But I don't recall Eternia having a roller coaster monorail. Right. <laughs> monorail. Like, it just, it doesn't... It doesn't reflect the show, and it's extremely fragile. So if you have one, don't ever ship it, ever. And Snake Mountain, for example, it looked really cool on the outside. It had that really weird removable microphone that's like a wolf's head, which I'm not really sure why, because it's Snake Mountain. Anyway, um, so it made your voice sound really creepy and weird as a kid. Um, and they still, it's ours that we have still kind of works. It, it just, you can't, it's not intelligible at all. But as you can see with Snake Mountain, there's no, um, there's a scale problem. Like, yeah. why do they have to walk sideways across that bridge? They don't actually fit the right way. Yeah, the figures have kind of a wide stance anyway because of the way they're created. So you, but you definitely can't walk anybody. And then once you go inside the playset, there really isn't anything there. In fact, we made a video of Skeletor singing that there's nothing here inside this playset. Yeah, it, the, the, the rumor is that that playset was intended for another toy line. And then um, it got recycled without being produced and got recycled into Masters of the Universe. And that's why it's out of scale with all the figures. But it's Snake Mountain. So uh, and then the, the playsets in Masters of the Universe actually got smaller, aside from Eternia. Hordak's Fright Zone, which had a rubber puppet feature. It's actually a very cool miniature playset, much like some of the Empire Strikes Back playsets. Uh, that came out. And then Masters of the Universe started the slime craze, which is, you know, uh, we're just going to have a pedestal where we just douse your figures in gunk. It has its merits. Yay. Don't do it to Moss Man. <laughs> right. Uh, so now we get to G.I. Joe. Uh, we wanted to put this on its own slide because, because G.I. Joe uh, set the benchmark in, in the, the early 80s uh, after Star Wars had already disappeared. And they kept that, that, um, they kept that standard up through the end of the decade. They were the last holdout for great action figure play sets. Uh, started with the headquarters, as we said, in the lower, lower left. Uh, and then it quickly upped the ante with the uh, USS Flag aircraft carrier. If you had this aircraft carrier or claimed to have it in school, you were either really spoiled or a liar. <laughs> <laughs> but you were probably really popular. I'm 6'3". I'm and if I laid down next to this thing, I don't think I'd still be as long as, as this toy was. Yeah. I knew one kid that had it. I saw it in person. His name was Philip. If he's watching the eventual video of this, I'm not going to say his last name, but you know who you are. <laughs> um, Philip was that kid that um, you might visualize as the, uh, the portly kid with the propeller beanie and the lollipop. He was really <laughs> spoiled. Um, this thing was so big, he had it in his room below his bed. He had a bunk bed. He would just jump down on it in the morning, walk over it, and then start his day. I saw him do it. Um, my point in saying this is that when we start talking about what makes a playset great, I think that's different from what makes a playset legendary. There's, there's a, there are playsets that are legendary because they're huge, like the, the USS Flag aircraft carrier. But is it great? Because what it is now is a $2,000 toy table. <laughs> uh, not to get too harsh on the, on the matter, but notice the kids are playing with everything else in yeah. the photo. Yeah. They're playing with the Rattler and a speakerphone, and they have their other toys ready to go. They're not really playing with the play set. 
Um, so anyway, but then let's let's talk about some of the other GI Joe playsets here for a minute because they deserve mention because they really are. I don't think these are overrated at all. Uh, the Terror Drome uh, on the on the on the bottom uh, bottom right. That playset was amazing. Came with a hidden vehicle jet that that rose up out of an elevator core that had a split dome door that was just, it was as epic as the show was. Uh, and then the fire bat, you know, would fly out of it. It had amazing uh, play features on the bottom with the opening compartments for the different vehicles that you could add into it. It was really cool. Um, the G.I. Joe uh, group apparently had this mobile uh, command center. I think it looks like an oil rig. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a really cool play set if you've ever seen one. Very modular, comes with a lot of features. Uh, then they kind of, really jumped the shark. Now this, this play set is super valuable, but I didn't get into it because I didn't know, I didn't know that the G.I. Joes were astronauts. <laughs> I was unaware that Shipwreck had training in zero gravity. Um, the G.I. Joe USS Defiant, the, uh, the, the space shuttle, it was huge. I mean, look at the kid next to it. It was massive. He could probably get inside the, the <laughs> shuttle and hide from his parents or something. <laughs> and it's super valuable. Um, and, and, and that just shows you the level that, that, that 80s playsets went to. The one on the top, the beige one, is the, um, the mobile command center. Uh, it, if you've never seen one before, they're actually very rickety. They're cool to look at, but they're not really cool to play with. It kind of reminds me of one of those um, television advertised rolly kits, like because it opens up like a tackle box. Uh, almost like the Hot Wheels City, where it kind of opens up on a suitcase thing and then the, the has like two levels. Uh, cool cool playset, very hard to find intact. But G.I. Joe was probably the most prolific playset maker of the 80s, hands down. All right, 1984. 1984 is kind of a benchmark year for, for a variety of toys. Uh, you had a wider variety, I think, here than any other year uh, up, in, up until like the early 90s. Uh, the GoBots Command Center uh, is infamous. Uh, I believe it was also featured on Robot Chicken because it really couldn't go very fast without any articulation in the legs. Um, the Hall of Justice was really was a really cool playset for the Superpowers line. It looked identical to the, the facade of it in the uh, Super Friends series. Um, the Castle of Lions is on the lower left from Voltron from Panache Place. That playset is deceptively cool. Uh, the action figures are notoriously ugly. Uh, but the playset itself is extremely accurate to everything that was on that show that made that show iconic. Uh, it had, you know, the, the tomb where the princess's father was buried. It had, even with the little bird statue that was a separate accessory, that bird statue was only seen in one episode in one, one shot, and it was in the, it was in the uh, playset. It had the rope where they jumped to go to the lions. Uh, it had the shuttle to take them there. It had a maintenance station. It had a computer. It, it, was, it was an amazing playset. It had the golden key that turned the uh, playset, no, it didn't turn the playset, that would have been awesome, but the key that turned the castle into a spaceship in the series, it had that with it. Um, we've talked about Snake Mountain, that was a real misfire uh, for Mattel. Um, the Hive, the one on the top right from Sectars by Coleco, that playset was huge. It was a huge, huge playset. Um, it had puppets that came out so you could grab the, the action figures and mangle them and uh, it had this strange um, cardboard facade on the other side, so it wasn't the greatest playset in the world, but it was, it gets points for just being big, because the, the Sektar's characters are like this. I mean, they're tall, and that playset was like huge. Um, and then, of course, Secret Wars tried to compete with superpowers and sort of failed miserably with the Tower of Doom, which is more like um, the plastic tower of garbage. <laughs> So 1985, this is uh, where we get the USS Flag aircraft carrier. We get the Hordak Fright Zone, top right. Uh, we also get some other interesting and unique play sets. Uh, the Boulder Hill gas station on the top left, that's from Mask. It was by Kenner. The cool thing about this play set is that it was two play sets in one. It was a gas station, in case you just wanted to play Rural Phillip. <laughs> or it turned into a super fortress because everything on mask turned into something else. Illusion is the ultimate weapon. Something so quintessential 80s. Yes. I mean, everything flipped out and became this massive battle fortress to defend against Venom. Uh, the one in the middle is a holy grail playset for anyone who recognizes it. The top middle is the Robotech SDF-1 Macross Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason a lot of you have never heard of it and neither did I until two years ago. Uh, Matchbox didn't have a good run trying to get these 
these toys uh, from Robotech to sell. And so a lot of their toys didn't get the proper marketing because Robotech wasn't played in all the right markets because television was independently syndicated back then. So what ended up happening is a lot of these toys, I can, I can vouch for it, I lived in Nashville in the 80s. Um, I never saw Robotech on television once, but the toys filled Circus World at the mall. But I didn't know what they were, so I didn't buy them. Now other people who had Robotech in their market and watched it could go to their toy stores and not find the toys at all. It was this weird distribution versus syndication problem. Um, and so what ended up happening is things like the SDF-1 were not made in large numbers. And so when you find it, that bottom piece is actually a, it's actually a hybrid playset. That bottom piece for the landing uh, area for the Veritex is actually cardboard and it folds up for storage. And then the top of it is a super accurate representation of the bridge of the Macross. Um, by all accounts, it's an awesome playset. I wish I could give you first-hand knowledge of working with it. I don't have it. Soon. Soon. Soon, Soon. we will have it. Uh, and then on the lower, the lower right, we have uh, the battle base from Wheeled Warriors, also known as Jason the Wheeled Warriors, the cartoon. Uh, the battle base was actually on the cartoon. Unfortunately, the cartoon and the toy line have a major disconnect in that none of the characters from the cartoon were actually figures in the toy line. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty bizarre. The, the, the vehicles are, um, but instead of having the uh, very 80s Mad Max skunk mulleted characters from the cartoon, they had these dudes in like orange jumpsuits with neckties. It was really strange. Uh, but the battle base uh, was a very cool like uh, maintenance depot for the little uh, interchangeable vehicles. You want to talk about 86? Ah, oh, 86. Um, to me, the best thing about 86 is Rambo because I only found out that there were Rambo toys about two years ago. And I completely, I was like, wow, how did I, I love Rambo. I mean, I love Rambo. And so I had to, of course, then get all of the toys. And, you know, this is probably the next thing on my list to get is this play set. Um, it kind of looks like an oil rig more than a defense, whatever it's supposed to be. But um, I kind of just want it because I can put all my, play, my figures on there and do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, we talked about Eternia already looking like a roller coaster of insanity. And um, Brave Star, um, I think you've probably got more. We just yeah. got a, uh, this Fort Carrium. Fort one. Carrium, it's massive because the Brave Star figures were almost 12 inches tall. I mean, they were, they were like Barbie doll size figures. And they made the entire main street of Fort Carrium for you to play with. It actually had interactive uh, light features, like laser light features, so that you could shoot characters off the, the, the observation towers, you know, and then it would, ah, and it would fall. Well, because uh, Brave Star had that, that Yeah, Brave Star came with these neutral laser guns. I know neutral laser. It sounds like a weird, like, drink or something. But um, <laughs> they, they came with these, um, there were these laser light guns that didn't come with the playset. You could get them separately, and you could interact with the playset with them almost like laser tag, but with action figures. Uh, it's massive. I haven't built it yet um, because I have nowhere to put it. It's, and the box itself is as big as a coffee table. I mean, it's crazy. That's the thing, that's the thing about collecting these playsets is once you start getting a lot of them, they kind of start taking over your house, seriously. More than action figures, more than anything else. It's insane. So there's the Captain Power power base, which had a similar idea. The, the Fort Carrium from Brave Star was from Mattel. Captain Power was from Mattel. They were really into the whole laser tag, laser light feature back then. They really tried to incorporate it into a lot of their toys. Um, and uh, it's a very rare playset now because Captain Power had a very short shelf life uh, compared to other toy lines. Uh, you'll also see on the top right, it's one of my personal favorites, although I don't own it, is the Karate Kid Training <coughs> Center. Because all that was was a place for daniel San to break crap um, <laughs> and beat up people, which is awesome. Uh, it, you know, you could get, you know, the ninja figures from Remco and uh, some Mr. Miyagi characters, and they had spring-loaded karate chops. You just go to town breaking railings and then putting them back together. Um, now, the lower left is a valuable play set. Uh, it's the Thundercats Lair. It's huge, and it also has sort of a laser light uh, feature on it as well. Uh, this place that's highly sought after because a lot of kids could not afford it because the Thundercats figures were this big. And that, you know, when you scale that up, that door in the center is taller or about as tall as lion -O. He was about like this with the hair. Uh, <laughs> so it was, uh, it, it was huge. And if you can find one with all of its pieces and it's in a reasonable shape, reasonable price, pick it up. Even if you don't want it, flip it. Um, now, on the lower right is a nostalgic favorite, but it's actually not a good play set at all, is the Ghostbusters Firehouse. Um, it looks deceptively cool. It's huge. It stands about this tall. 
It's a brick. It's indestructible. I mean, if your dog ran into it 20 times, it would be fine. <laughs> um, the problem with the, the playset is that if you look at that interior shot of it on the left, the, uh, the bay on the bottom is actually not big enough to put the car in. <laughs> and even if you do fit part of the car in, the doors won't open, so... Right, or the doors won't close. The, the, the front doors of the firehouse will stay open, or they'll, the, the, the car will be hanging off the back. It actually, the car had a, a gunner chair on the top. It can't go in with the gunner chair. You have to constantly pull the gunner chair off to get the car inside. Um, yeah, the place, that it, it, and it also has no stairs or elevators to the other floors. Well, it has like this weird function. So you can put, you have to put two figures on this little round, I, I don't even see like the little. It's a fire pole simulator. It's a fire pole simulator. So there's actually something missing off of this particular um, example. There's like a little yellow circle that goes around that blue pole. And you can put two figures on it to evenly distribute the weight. And then they spin all the way down. But they. At the one that we have anyway, it gets hung all the time. So you yeah. really have to very carefully balance and you have to pick the right figures that are evenly weighted. So yes, it's because Ray is a little portly, but Egon's real skinny. So the weight <laughs> gets thrown off and then it doesn't work. Right. Ah, the late 80s. So yeah, I, I, I sense some uh, nostalgia going through the room. <laughs> oh, Ninja Turtles, woo! Uh, <laughs> Ninja Turtles was one of the last major lines uh, to have multiple play sets uh, before they started to get away from it. Uh, the, the last real uh, character to have play sets consistently was Batman, and that's because he recycled his play set like 20 times, but I won't get into that, and that was in the 90s. Um, the Ninja Turtles first started with the sewer play set, which was a cool sort of modular play set on the top right. Uh, came with a lot of interesting features, but it also came with a lot of useless um, uh, useless accessories that uh, easily get lost, but you don't know why they ever included them anyway. So for example, if you look at that photograph, you'll see the uh, fire hydrant, the yellow fire hydrant. On the lower right next to it is this yellow plug in the street. That's not a button that does something. It's not a weapon that they can pick up and throw. It has no play value. It's just pegged in there very loosely. And guess what gets lost? So if you're a completist and you want a Ninja Turtles playset, that will always be missing. You're going to have to cobble together like three to get that back. Um, Same with the yellow mine that's yes, sitting Yes, the up yellow there. mine that's over on that that's supposed to drop through. Um, that little blue radar dish on the side on the right that actually op uh, operates the elevator up and down. All those things kind of get lost, but at least those have functionality, whereas that little fire plug, I still ask myself why they included that. Uh, and then they had the Technodrome which was a much more uh, superior playset as far as the construction and the quality. Had a lot of action features. It was the villain's playset, so that meant you know, Shredder and Krang and all those characters could really <laughs> you know, get, get involved. Uh, and then Toy Biz uh, came in with the Keaton Batman film in 89 with the Batcave. Um, this is not the Batcave I was referring to earlier that was repeated a number of times. Very quickly after this in the 90s, uh, Kenner got the license one year later and they produced a Wayne Manor with a Batcave. That Batcave was recycled with just a different paint job for Batman Returns, Batman the Animated Series, Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, and then a Legends of the Dark Knight. Like, so you can get it so easily just with different stickers. It's like, oh, I've got the one with Danny DeVito stickers. Oh, I've got the one with animated stickers. Like it, but it's the same thing. And speaking of that, there's another playset that gets recycled um, and actually is better than the yes. original. Yes, the Ewok Village. Yeah, in 1991, it was recycled for Kevin Costner's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves line uh, as Sherwood Forest. And they gave it a tree canopy with leaves. So it actually looks like trees now rather than a dead hurricane uh, incident. Um, it's really cool, actually. If you're a Star Wars collector, get it. If you're a Robin Hood collector, I want to ask you why you collect Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. <laughs> So just briefly, I know the ladies in the room in particular are probably looking and going, why haven't we talked about any of the girls' play sets? Um, personally, I had about four play sets when I was a kid, and most of them were My Little Pony. Uh, I had uh, Strawberry Shortcake and stuff like that. I know She-Ra is probably, in my mind, probably the coolest play set for girls in the 80s. A lot of girls' play sets are very domestic. 
which is part of that gender role identification thing that was, you know, it's not so much now, but certainly in the 80s, it was like girls need to learn how to vacuum and wash dishes. So we're going to, you know, really push that. Um, these are a couple of examples of both. So a lot of the times you'll have things that are castles or My Little Pony you have stable. Like the first thing that My Little Pony came out with was the, the show stable which is not really domestic, although it is something you can find in our world, unlike some of the boys' play sets. Um, but then they even started moving toward the My Little Pony Nursery, the My Little Pony School of Ballet, you know, things like that that are very girly. Um, I think probably the most outlandish thing, aside from a castle, is this Barbie and the Rockers, the, the stage setup, so you can pretend to be a rock star. But again, it's, it's sort of not as appealing to me anyway as a collector now because it's like, well, this isn't really inspiring my imagination to go outside of doing laundry. I already get to do that, so I don't really want to <laughs> pretend to do that. So we want to know what you guys think are the best play sets. Yeah, um, this is kind of where we start the Q&A and just kind of talk because we didn't want to impose upon you like our idea of the best place that's we really wanted to start a discussion because I know a lot of you either had or still have or collect some of these and so we kind of wanted to get your thoughts and get your questions so if anybody has a question um, we can start a discussion please come up to the mic and, and we'll get going a couple of uh, quick questions uh -huh. it should be It's on. I think it's on now. Okay. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, one, uh, uh, in, in the uh, refurbishing and the, and the uh, sort of uh, fixing up the old sets, what steps do you take in, uh, in, uh, in uh, rebuilding, in, in, in re-strengthening, and, uh, um, and sort of uh, patching up uh, the ones that are made out of really cheap plastic or cardboard? And also, do you know when they started including sets that had little support tanks for the action figures so you wouldn't have to, so they wouldn't fall over or have to be standing looking like they have a multiple sclerosis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, I'll answer that last one first. Uh, the pegs really started, at, from what I've seen with Star Wars with their cardboard play sets, they started including the white pegs to make sure that the figures could stand on those cardboard environments. Uh, and those pegs are highly collectible too because a lot of them got lost, so you can have, you have to repopulate your, your play sets with those. Um, as far as uh, rebuilding play sets and, and fixing the ones with the flimsy plastic, you really only have a few options. One, you start using epoxy and then you got to repaint, which devalues your play set even more, although it's unsightly with a crack. So, uh, Or uh, you just, um, when it comes to certain, certain uh, play sets, you have to actually just cobble together a good one from three or four bad ones. Uh, but when it comes to the ones like the Migos, where they're like rippable plastic with the, with the blow molded uh, material, yeah, you're either going to have to like use really awesome scotch tape that doesn't yellow, which I wouldn't recommend, or you actually have to like, some people have actually, uh, they take like a, an X-Acto knife with a razor blade and they make it red hot and then they actually remelt the plastic back together mm. so it's not cracked anymore. I have never been that brave. <laughs> I, I won't do it. There are also sticker sheets online for different uh, toy lines. So if you have missing stickers that have, you know, just lost their stick and have fallen off, basically, of either your vehicles or your play sets, you can print those out on sticker paper and put them back on. Um, that's not terribly um, damaging or devaluing to your stuff because you can remove stickers. So if you wanted to sell it with all original, you know, you could do that. But it does make it display nicer. So that's op also an option. And I understand that we have less than five minutes left. So if anybody else has a question, I think we can get like one or two more independent. Go ahead. I think they want you to do it at the mic real quick. But or I can repeat it, the question. I'll yeah, repeat we the can question. repeat the question. Yeah, just go ahead and ask. I'll repeat it. Okay. Um, you said, I noticed you didn't bring up Dino Saucer. Dino Saucer toys, if I recall, never made it to market. They did. They did. I played with them when I was in a Kmart. I got big trouble. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 not a blue light special that I would want. Yeah, I knew, I knew that Cadillacs and Dinosaurs and Dino Riders had play sets. I didn't know that Dinosaurs ever got play sets. I mean, I know they had toys in the works, but I didn't know they actually made it to market. Yeah, so. they had a huge, they had a team in a box about this big, and it was like their lava lair, you can land a ship in it. 
I wouldn't land a ship in a lava pit. <laughs> um, no, thanks. I, I, I'll have to look that up. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Otherwise, we'll close out with Melinda's favorite playset. Oh, yeah. My favorite playset <laughs> is the Castle of Lions because it is Voltron and it's got lions and it's got all kinds of really cool features. I really didn't ever. Actually, that playset is the reason why we have our channel now because we saw several reviews of it online that were. I'll say subpar, and uh, you know we we always want to show things that are totally complete. So if, if our viewers want to see it, they can really see what all the functionality is. So um, I have to sort of give some love to that playset. Yeah, it is, it is an amazing playset. We want to thank everybody for being here today. Thank you so much. If you'd like to, to keep in touch with us, we have business cards here. Uh, they're not really business cards. They're cards they're, for you to get in touch with yeah. us. Yeah, and this, we um, also have a mailing list if you want to meet us outside. Um, you can sign up, and basically all it we're not selling anything. Basically, we just notify you whenever we post a new video to YouTube and so you can keep up with us. Yeah, because so. we, want, we want to be friends with all of you. So yeah. thank you so much for coming. Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We can make that happen. Yeah. <laughs>